Fantastic. <laughs> it's lovely to see some familiar faces. Gosh. So we've already started live streaming, but we've not started our talk just yet. So just a very warm welcome to you. And we're going to do this in a certain order once everybody's settled. Um, I think we've almost got a full house already. And uh, Ajahn Brown's here, of course. And it's lovely to see people this morning. So we'll just wait another minute to see if a few more people turn up. <laughs> For those on live stream who are watching us already, this is the Bliss Upon Bliss Upon Bliss six day online meditation retreat with Ajahn Brown. And I'll be assisting him as well and doing some talks in the evening. So you're in the right place. We're just waiting a couple more minutes for people to arrive and then we're going to start with a proper introduction. It's amazing to see people from all over the world, even though this is the UK time zone. I know that there are some people uh, tuning in from America and possibly from Asia as well. So some of you have uh, reset your internal clocks to follow this retreat, which is very impressive. All right, shall we begin? And I'll invite Anne-Marie, first of all, to just give a little overview of the retreat and of the project that this is in support of. So welcoming Anne-Marie, one of our co-hosts. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome everyone um, to this very special dual Sangha retreat organized by uh, Venerable Chanda on behalf of Anukampa Bikuni project. My name is Anne-Marie. Um, and I'm one of the co-hosts assisting Venerable Chanda on the Zoom platform, uh, along with Derek <laughs> and also Mel, um, who you can't see at the moment because uh, she's uh, recording all of our sessions uh, and also live streaming on Facebook. So that means that you can um, revisit them um, at any time you like, both during as well as after the retreat. Um, so yeah, just a few words about the Anukampa project. It was founded by Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda in 2016. It's a UK-based charity and has the dual aim of both promoting the teachings and the practices of early Buddhism, as well as developing the first Bhikkhuni monastery uh, in the UK, where women can train towards full ordination. And this retreat is very special to us, um, as it helps us to further both of these aims. Now, the monastery will not only be for women wishing to ordain, um, but equally for anyone of any color, gender, age, or sexual orientation uh, who wishes to deepen their practice um, and could come and stay in the monastery to um, experience the monastic lifestyle firsthand. Um, and of course, there'll be retreats like this as well. Um, now, every year since 2016, Ajahn Brahm has been coming to England um, to teach for us in support of Anukampa. 
Um, but of, of course, this year things are a little bit different. And we're very grateful to both him as well as Venerable Chanda uh, that they've agreed to uh, teach this retreat online for us instead. Now, in the true spirit of Buddhism, both our teachers offer their time and wisdom in the spirit of generosity. And for those of you who feel moved to join in with this spirit, uh, we will invite you at the end of the retreat to offer donations uh, or dana to support um, Anukampa's work. And you could do this entirely at your own discretion, of course. And for those listening on the live stream uh, who would like to support the monastery project, you can find more information on anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. Now, another reason that this retreat is um, an important event for Anukampa is that it helps us to build our budding community um, and strengthen our support, both locally as, um, as well as internationally, as, as you can see. Um, and on the last day of the retreat, we will also give you some more information about the different ways that you may like to get involved. Now, the most profound support of all, though, um, is in deepening our practice together. So. It's wonderful to see so many of us from so many different places uh, together here today to do just that. Um, so without further ado, I wish you all a beautiful retreat, a blissful one. And uh, I'll now hand you over to Venerable Chanda, who will welcome Ajahn Brahm uh, and offer a bit more of an orientation into the retreat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Very beautifully introduced. <laughs> So yeah, welcome to this shared space of spiritual community. We're going to be together for the next six days and the retreat will start very shortly with an introduction and the precepts from Anjan Brown. So you have the choice whether you would like to take the five or the eight precepts for this retreat. And we'll finish on Thursday. The formal teachings will finish at about 1.30 in the afternoon with Ajahn Brown's last session. And then we'll have another session from about two till three where we can meet together. So there'll be time to discuss together, get to know each other and share some of our retreat experience with other retreatants if you choose. So on the website, we've um, explained that this retreat is designed to be spacious, to give you a lot of personal practice time so that you can find your own rhythm and your own pace with the practice. Um, and we'll give some tips. You can always also ask questions about how best to make use of that personal practice time. Uh, we are asking for full-time attendance for this retreat. And I'm really delighted to see that pretty much everybody who's applied has showed up this morning, which is great. Um, and this will help you to get the full potential of the practice. But if at any stage you find that it's no longer possible or conducive for you to be able to join every session, then please let us know because we do have a wait list of people who would jump at the opportunity and you can always catch it up on live stream or on the recorded uh, videos that will upload to our channel. So practicing on a home retreat can be different from just watching online talks. And I would also like to suggest that people watching through Facebook Live can join in with this home retreat experience, even if they're not actually in the Zoom room with us, because it can be very rewarding. And one of the most powerful ways in which it differs from watching the online talks is that you carve out a space dedicated to silent practice with none of the usual distractions and disturbances. So essentially, you're actually taking time out of your everyday life to delve deeply into your inner world. To support yourself in this process, whether you're on the Zoom call or whether you're on Facebook Live, please try to maintain the noble silence. So this includes not using any electronic devices, including mobile phones and hopefully your emails as well. Um, obviously, other than the one that you have to use to watch the Zoom sessions. And uh, such noble silence helps to cultivate sense restraint, which in turn facilitates the quietening of the mind. And it helps the mind to incline towards its inner happiness and peace. So we are asking also that you try to uh, use this Zoom room as a virtual Dhamma hall. So in just the same way that in a Dhamma hall, we would maintain silence and a certain kind of quiet conduct, we'll be doing that also in this Zoom room. So even though we're together, we work as if we were alone. You can choose to have your screen on gallery view or on speaker view, depending on what you find most supportive. So you'll find the little buttons at the top right corner 
Um, one of those, the speaker view will show you everybody's screen. So you have a sense of us being together. And the other one is the speaker view. You'll just see whoever's speaking at the time. So you may want to experiment with that and find what seems most supportive for you. But please don't interact with any of the other retreatants because obviously they're also on retreat. So it supports them as it supports you if we try to work as though we were alone. So normally for those who've come to my sessions online or to other Zoom sessions, we do use the chat box to speak to each other. But this time we're going to disable that, um, that functionality so that if you have any questions during the Q&A sessions for Ajahn Brahm or for myself, you'll be please submitting them to Anne-Marie. She's just changed her name there. So it says Anne-Marie for Q. We can't see Q and A, but that does say for Q and A. Um, and so nobody else will see your question and it will limit the amount of interaction that we have. And then um, I will read out those questions for Ajahn Brown and we'll discuss how that's gonna work in the evening. So there'll be two times every day where you can put some questions to us. But please do keep those questions concise if you can and related to your meditation practice or related to the subject of the talk. Um, as we do have a lot of people here. So at most we would recommend one question per day. Okay, so without any uh, further discussion for me, I would like to hand over now to Ajahn Brahm and just say how grateful and delighted we are to have you here Ajahn and recognizing what a generous offering this is for us, you know, to give us six whole days of your time. Um, I'm sure everyone is just as delighted as I am to have you here. And I don't think Ajahn Brahm needs a lot of introduction. I think he's pretty infamous by now. So, um, <laughs> so handing over to you Ajahn uh, for the refuges and precepts and to introduce the day. Thank you very much. Right, Have a wonderful you. retreat. Thank you, Venerable Chanda and Anne-Marie uh, for this um, opportunity to give and to serve. Even though there's many other things which I do in my life, still the opportunity to give, to serve, to participate in something wonderful and noble is something which nobody can really resist. At least I can't anyway. And we're going to start uh, this retreat by giving the three refuges and the five precepts, and, and then the eight precepts. For those of you who want to uh, begin this in a spiritual way, and I will say something about the precepts and the refuges afterwards. But these refuges and the precepts are excellent ways of living one's life. And I think you all know what happens if you start breaking precepts. You just get into much more trouble. You want to have a nice peaceful life. And I still remember the time when I was teaching a retreat in a, it was in a Christian retreat center, but for Buddhists. And as I was teaching this retreat, I just looked out of the window and I saw two gentlemen, two elderly gentlemen. They were leaving to go home after their church service. And one said to the other, be good. And his friend replied, no, that's no fun. And I, heard that and I was quite disappointed. Why is it that people believe that to have fun you have to break precepts and not be good? And to me, when you are good, you have far more fun in life. So the precepts are part of feeling bliss. Bliss upon bliss upon bliss. Starts with being a good person. If you want to have a good life, then be good. If you want to have a good time, be good. So quite honestly, I often tell a lot of people, I am a good time monk. I have a good time, <laughs> but not by going to, to pubs or football matches or cinemas or anything like that. Have a good time by serving, being peaceful and knowing the secret of bliss in one's heart and in one's practice. But first of all, I think you should all have these little sheets of the precepts. I hope you have those because if you can access them and then I will give these uh, precepts and the refuges one after the other. And then just you can even just 
listen to them or say them if you wish. But the most important thing is not getting, getting the pronunciation right. It's actually understanding what you're doing. So it really means something to you. So I'll go through the three refuges first of all. And after the three refuges, the five precepts. And after the five precepts, the eight precepts. Is that okay? Hope so. I usually put my hands up when I give precepts because I respect these as a uh, as a gift, as an inheritance from the Buddha himself. I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Dhamma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Buddha. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Dhamma. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Sangha. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Buddha. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Dhamma. And for the third time, I go for refuge to the Sangha. And that completes the three refuges. And now if you turn on over the page, page two of this precepts, you have the five precepts. So as you see, I'm, to save a bit of time, I'm not just pausing to allow you to say these things. You can say these precepts along with me or just listen to these precepts as I say them and just assent to them. Yes, I want to do this. I undertake the training precept to abstain from killing living beings. I undertake the training precept to abstain from taking what is not given. I undertake the precept to abstain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to abstain from false speech. And I undertake the training precept to abstain from alcoholic drinks or drugs that cloud the mind and cause heedlessness. Those are the five precepts from the time of the Buddha. And when people want to do that little extra simplicity of their life for at least a few days, we have what we call the eight precepts. So those who wish to keep the eight precepts, please say these after me. You find that some of them are the same, but they add a little bit extra to them. Number one, I undertake the precept to abstain so to abstain from killing living beings. I undertake the precept to abstain from taking what is not given. I undertake the precept to abstain from sexual conduct, not just misconduct, but all sexual conduct. I undertake the training precept to abstain from false speech. I undertake the training precept to abstain from alcoholic drink or drugs that cloud the mind and cause heedlessness. Now we have the three extra precepts. I undertake the precept to abstain from eating at the wrong time after solar noon. I undertake the training precept to abstain from dancing, singing, music, going to see entertainments, wearing jewelry, using perfumes, and beautifying the body with cosmetics. And lastly, I undertake the precept to abstain from using high or luxurious beds and seats. Those become the eight precepts which allow us to live a simple life. It is the precepts which monks and nuns live by all their life and also which other people keep for many days often when stay in retreat centers or monasteries to make a very peaceful and beautiful life. So those are the three refuges 
and the five precepts. I closed my eyes when I was saying that because they mean a lot to me. To explain what I mean by why these precepts mean a lot to me. That when I first became a Buddhist monk, sorry, when I was the first a Buddhist as a student, when I went to see monks at Buddhist temples, unfortunately in those days, there was no nuns around at all. There was a great lack in uh, UK and many other places in the world. But when I did start to see some Buddhist monks and enjoyed seeing their lifestyle of simplicity and hearing some of their teachings, it made the what I'd read about Buddhism alive. You could see it in front of you. And little by little, as my meditation started to develop, I started to feel that it was wrong, you know, to stamp on, a, on an ant or a beetle or even swat a mosquito. It didn't feel right. And in fact, on one occasion where my father had died and there was a mouse in my mother's apartment, I decided to take on the role as the male protector and catch that mouse. And I was successful. It's one of the worst things which I did because I put the mouse trap out. It caught that mouse. And I took the mouse, which was now dead, you know, to I put it in the rubbish bins to be taken away. And I remember stroking it and its fur was so beautiful. It's such a beautifully created little being. And I felt so guilty that I was the cause of its death. Being able to touch it, feel it, just after its death, had a huge impact on me that I never wanted ever again to harm living beings. <laughs> and even stealing, for those of you who know the city of London, very often those buses in the morning were very busy. And so sometimes the bus conductor never wanted, or so we never had the time to ask for my fare. But after a while, I felt that someone had to pay those wages and it was a very cheap journey. So why couldn't I not pay anyway? And so I started to always pay my fare, even if it wasn't asked. And see sexual misconduct at that time, I had girlfriends. I was gonna say girlfriends, not at the same time because they were expensive. And <laughs> I didn't see the point in sort of mis having misconduct, you know, in your, as a young man, in your uh, association with other people. It didn't feel right. I didn't want it to happen to me, so I wouldn't do it to them. And of course, lying. If ever I lied, I felt so bad about that. And I felt so much more confidence in telling the truth. And even with alcohol, after a while, alcohol and drugs, I couldn't see the point in it after a while. I still went to parties and had a wonderful time. And I experimented and found I had a much better time when you didn't have alcohol and drugs. You remembered everything, you're more aware, and much safer from any danger. And I wonder why are people wanting to uh, take alcohol and non-medicinal drugs? They say it's having a good time. My experience is well, you have a much better time when you don't take those things. And so I'd remember the occasion when in the old Thai temple in London, the, the Wat Buddha Padipa, the time it was in uh, East Sheen. And the monks there, I was hanging around there helping out. And one of the monks came up to me one day and said, you've been here visiting long enough. It's about time you took the five precepts. When they told me that, I said, what are the five precepts? I had never been taught them. And when he explained to me what they were, I wasn't being arrogant. I was being truthful. And I said to the monk, I don't need to take those precepts from you because I've been keeping them and extra precepts for the last year or two. It was something I discovered myself. 
I saw the use in it, the benefit of them. And to this day, 46 years I've been a Buddhist monk now, or 47, it's 46 and a half, I think. And in all those years which I've been a Buddhist monk, I found great joy and happiness keeping precepts. It means there's many desires which I cannot follow. But what I do have instead is the joy of freedom from desire. So because the desires are forbidden by precepts, they just don't come up. Which means that you have this wonderful sense of being unburdened with all these dangerous choices which people make in life. When people ask me, aren't you just feel burdened by these precepts? I say, no, I feel freed by these precepts, liberated by them. And I hopefully that you will find the same when you start keeping precepts of honesty and simplicity and um, of gentleness, you'll find other people, other beings will look on you and they will feel so much better in your company. That they'll feel that sense of trust, which is hard to find in this world. You trust one another implicitly. So that's a wonderful thing about these precepts. They're not a burden at all. And if you try them for a few days, who knows? You may get addicted to them, which is a wonderful thing. But these are not addictions which you you praise yourself over others and you think you're so much better than others. How many precepts have you got? Five? Oh, I've got six. Six? Oh, I had six a long time ago. I've got eight. This is nothing about who's the best, but who's the most free. And that's why even just keeping precepts makes you so peaceful. And on this... Uh, internet retreat it's also wonderful that you know you can have your time in your home i don't know where you are meditating and so often people complain that they don't have the time to meditate because they have got other people always disturbing them hopefully that you can find a little room or some place in your flat in your house or wherever you're meditating a room where you can just do your meditation. It's a little shrine room, a little holy area. We have many rooms in our house. We have a room to go to bed. We have a room to eat. Why can't we have a little room or a corner of a room or even a cupboard? And open, empty that cupboard out as a place where you can meditate. A holy corner of your house or flat or wherever you are living. To be able to do that, it gives you the opportunity to actually find some peace in your life. And here, we're trying to give you that encouragement and those teachings of what to do when you get into your private space and how to make this mind go to its natural state of peacefulness. And I say a natural state of peacefulness because the biggest mistake people make when they meditate is putting forth too much effort. They try to be peaceful and they compel themselves to relax, which of course never works. It's a good thing that you are meditating alone, apart from others, so other people can't see you. So you can't be judged whether you sit up perfectly straight or whether you're not off to sleep. It's just wonderful, whatever you do, as long as you are Meditating, it doesn't matter just how deep you get or how shallow your, your mind is. Just leave it alone, it develops by itself. But the first little example of meditation I'm now going to give you was from my teacher Ajahn Chah, who used other similes not found in the suttas but which you cannot argue with because you know, they are so informative, so wonderful. And they allow people who've never meditated before to understand what meditation is and how easy it is if you understand what's involved. And this was a teaching which when I give retreats, the usual, the old retreats where you sit in front of a lot of people, 
I always give this simile on the first or second day when I hold up my hand and I start waving it. And this was from Ajahn Chah. He said, this represents a leaf on a tree or on a bush. And it only moves because a wind is blowing on it. If that wind stops, then the leaf will still move, but less and less until it comes to a perfect state of stillness, all by itself. Why? Because that is the natural state of a leaf to be motionless. It only moves because something outside of it forces it to shake. In the same way Ajahn Chah would say that the human mind, its nature, its default state, as we would say today, is to be perfectly still. It only moves because something outside of it is making it shake. And what's making it move are called the winds of wanting. <sighs> Making the mind move up and down, left and right. But if we can let go of those winds of wanting, so in meditation we don't want anything in the whole world. We don't want to go backwards or forwards into the past or into the future. We don't want to change anything. We don't want to get anything. We literally let go of everything in the whole universe. We don't want anything. Then you'll find your mind moves less and less and less. And stage by stage, it becomes more and more still. Because no wanting, no desire is making it move anymore. Until they get so still, the amazing things happen. When the mind becomes still, things disappear. In the same way that when you close your eyes, I invite you all to close your eyes just for a few minutes. Oh, sorry, not for, just for a minute. When you close your eyes, you can first of all see the inside of your eyelids. But after a few more moments, you can't even see those. The sense of sight turns off because nothing is moving. You can open your eyes now. Same with your sense of smell, your sense of taste, because nothing is happening. There's an ambient smell, there's an ambient taste in your mouth. After a while, the sense of smell and taste turn off. Little by little, stillness creates a disappearance of the five senses. And as nothing makes those senses move, you're sitting comfortably in a chair or on the ground. After a while, with the five senses turned off, the mind, the sixth sense, starts to manifest. You can see it very clearly. And that sixth sense also becomes calm and still. And that too exhibits the same quality of things vanishing and disappearing. You go into these wonderful deep states of meditation, not because you do it, but because you just sit there perfectly still not wanting anything in the whole world, just being here. But little by little, this path of meditation is very easy when you don't get involved. And you're just watching, not just watching, but caring for what you're watching. And this is where I bring up the, what I call this, well, not what I call, what actually is, the second factor of the Eightfold Path taught by the Buddha. The second factor is what's called right motivation. Samasankapa is where you're coming from. And if you're coming from letting go, renunciation, in Pali it's called nekama. 
I sometimes call it this making peace and awayapada, kindness, and ahingsaka, or well, actually it's wihingsaka, it means the same, which means gentleness, not violence, non aggression. Where in our meditation is coming from making peace, being kind, and being gentle you'll find the meditation gets so easy. You're caring for this moment. You're being gentle with your body and mind. And you're just making peace with every moment, not fighting things, but letting things calm down by themselves. And so this becomes a little path of meditation, which you can do at any time, any place. And it leads to great senses of stillness and peacefulness, and with that, enormous happiness. This retreat is called Bliss Upon Bliss Upon Bliss. And where did that title come from? There was a chapter which I, I wrote in one of the books a long time ago, you know, called the, um, uh, basically, Meditation Bliss and Beyond as to how this mind works and why people like myself and Venerable Chanda are ordained bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. What motivates us to live this life? Where does the smile on a monk or a nun come from? It's because as we do this meditation practice, because we're letting go of wanting little by little, in the, just the, in the meditation periods, you get more and more energy. You're allowing your mind to relax and rest. And as the mind relaxes and rests, it builds up energy and power. And as the mind gets more and more energy and power, just because you're not doing anything, you're saving energy rather than always exhausting energy. It is that point you find that you get happier and just more alive. And not just alive, you become more happy and joyful. You can see more bliss in life. It's one of the core reasons why the depression starts to disappear. If you are doing too much and worrying too much, especially what, worrying what other people think of you and trying to please too many other people, you find all that just tires your mind out, let alone your body. And your mind gets so exhausted. And the way to overcome that exhaustion, what I still think is the best way, if you do it properly, is the meditation practice. Which is sitting down and relaxing. And if you're tired, allowing yourself to be tired. It's not breaking any precept if you fall asleep during meditation. In fact, you will find that if you fall asleep during meditation, it's far, far, far better than being too um, restless. And I say that because there was one of these suttas. It's a bit of an adaption, but it's not you know, that far from how the Buddha taught it, where he was walking with his attendant, Ananda, and he saw a monk on the edge of the forest, sitting meditation, so quiet and a perfect posture. Then the Buddha turned to Ananda and said, I'm worried about that monk. And soon after that monk was wrote. And then he went deeper into the forest and saw another monk there who was meditating as well, but he was nodding this way and nodding that way. Obvious sloth and torpor. And the Buddha smiled. I'm not worried about him. It was counterintuitive. The Buddha was praising a monk, a meditator who was sleepy and not praising the monk who was sitting ramrod straight. Why? And it's very obvious, it's certainly really obvious to me after so many years meditating and teaching meditation, 
The reason was the first monk sitting ramrod straight was a control freak. You could sit like that. There was no peace in the mind. Perfect posture, but a mind which was so tight and tense. And after a while, you can't stay like that. Even right now, after all these years, my arms bowl was given to me by a French monk who disrobed. And that was, oh, I don't know, 42 years ago. And we all thought he was an excellent monk because he would always sit straight, never, never bending down, never sort of uh, showing any sign of sloth and torpor. But the only way he could do that, he told me, was by forcing his mind. And it's amazing he lasted for three or four years torturing himself to sit straight. He wouldn't allow his body to, to move. That was so painful. He never got anywhere in that meditation. And eventually he disrobed and went back to the world. I still have his bowl as a reminder to me, a personal reminder of how not to meditate. And sometimes he'd look at the other monks who were nodding and felt jealous. You could not let go enough. What happens is that when you do let go, yes, you might feel some sleepiness come. Don't fight it. You have some mindfulness left. Just be aware as best you can of what's happening right now. And don't worry about any future. Just be aware right now and be kind. Make peace. Be kind. Be gentle with your body and mind as it is. And then little by little, you'll find the sleepiness will just disappear by itself. You get more energy coming up. It may take a while, but it's the fastest way. And after that while, you'll find the sleepiness just vanishes. And that you are left with a mind which is poised, energized, but clear. And the body looks after itself, it straightens up. I know many occasions, many times when I was meditating, my body was slumped because it was really tired. I've been working a lot. And when I just learned how to relax, just minute by minute, you could feel energy come back into your body and into your mind. And as that energy increased, it got to a point where the body just straightened up all by itself. I didn't give the command, the body straightened by itself. And from that moment on in that meditation, the mind was really poised, enough energy, no sleepiness to go even deeper into these wonderful stages of bliss, which is what we're talking about on this retreat. Bliss upon bliss, and this is just the start of it. Later on, you know, the, the sheer happiness of meditation, that's why I call it bliss, it gets really, really delicious, ecstatic, but not the sort of bliss and ecstasy, which means you go dancing around and, and throwing your hands up in the air and dancing and stuff. It's a bliss which is inside, poise, the most delicious form of happiness which I've ever experienced. A bliss of freedom, of like you've been in a jail, and now you're free of that jail. Ah, bliss at last, freedom, with nothing to worry about, with no burdens, no responsibilities during the time of the meditation. And then when you have that you know, release from a few hours or hour or whatever, then you can go back to the world with great energy and you can serve and give. When you get tired, you go back again and this out again. <laughs> so this is actually how this happens. But little by little, as you start to meditate, you find just how you can feel your way into these beautiful deep meditations. You feel your own way into them and you start off with just your posture, the way you're sitting. And as you're sitting meditation, or sometimes people lie down to meditate, because you know we do spend a lot of time in our life lying down. 
And there are times when you get sick in the hospital, you have to lie down. There's no reason at all why you can't get into deep meditation when you're lying down. And, and those of you who heard me talk, as, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's sell this anecdote because it's important at this time. It was when in my second year in Thailand, I developed scrub typhus fever. No one knew what it was. There was not supposed to be any scrub typhus. It has the same symptoms of typhoid on the outside, but on the inside, it, you know, there's not the same virus. So the, it's not typh typhoid. So all those drugs don't help. It's caused by a little mite living in the forest. And as little mites in the forest, when forest monks go and meditate in the forest, or even sleep out there in the forest instead of the huts, that's where you get bitten, you get scrub typhus from. So I got scrub typhus, and it's like most diseases, you haven't got the remedy, that really knocks you out. You felt there's no energy at all, and one day, four weeks, I think, roughly, into that disease, I was just lying in a bed in the monk's ward of Ubon Rajatani Hospital in the northeast, just lying there, just feeling terrible. Absolutely no energy and fever came again. Well, what do you do? So I decided just let's meditate. And the amazing thing was you can meditate even though you have a fever and got zero energy. It's because I was maybe desperate, had no other choice. And anyway, you got into a really, really nice deep meditation where the body disappeared, you're blissing out. It showed me just you can bliss out even when you know you're really sick. And when I came out afterwards, the meditation, I just happened to take note of my posture. <laughs> and for those of you who've been in a hospital feeling terrible with fevers and stuff. You know, one leg is one way, another leg is a totally different direction, arms all over the place. It was not a posture I've ever seen, ever seen in any book on how to meditate. But this was how my body wanted to be. I let it be. And the body just disappeared and got into a really, really great meditation. Now, the reason I say that story it's not just to praise myself. It's a personal story because that means I, I'm honest about it. I know it happened. But I'd say that story to show you that the posture is not so important. There's no magic posture the way you sit in meditation. The only thing to remember is to be aware of your body, be kind to it, and to get into a point of deep relaxation. Now, shortly, I'll be giving a guided meditation for you all. And I will start, I'll spend quite a while just being aware of, asking you to be aware of your body, doing a sweeping meditation. And as you're aware of your body, it's not just awareness I'm going to ask you to cultivate, but also there's kindness as well. It's like being aware, making peace, being kind and being gentle with your own body, is developing the second factor of the A4 path on your own body, mindfulness and kindness, basically. And as you are mindful and kind of your parts of your body, you come to places in your body which hurt, which are tense, you can feel them tight. It's really difficult to say, and describe these things to yourself because sometimes you don't have the vocabulary the language to describe these things, but you know those what those pains, those aches, those tensions feel like. Why do you know what they feel like without even having a name for them? Then you can notice that those feelings, they change. They get worse or they get lighter, easier, more comfortable. And of course, the question is why? And as you're experiencing those changes, in your physical feelings, you soon learn just how to relax your body, zooming into a painful, achy part, being really kind to it, and you find it eases off immensely. The mindfulness gives you the feedback 
In other words, you know, if you do it properly, you feel it's, the feeling gets less. If you do it wrongly, you find you get more tense. Why? Controlling it, trying to get rid of things, makes it much more tense. Relaxing, letting go, makes it at ease, allowing the body to heal itself. So little by little, we are just meditating on our body to relax it deeply and bring it to a state of ease all over the body. And when you do that, afterwards, the whole body just feels just so light, so light and relaxed that it has a delightful feeling to it, a pleasure of relaxation. And that's something which I've focused on. Just body contemplation or body sweeping, body relaxation. You learn what stresses your body and what makes it feel so at ease. You just learn how to relax and feel the delight of a relaxed body. Now that delight is something very special because the delight of a relaxed body, the pleasure of it, makes you more relaxed. You see the level of relaxation goes even deeper. And that really teaches you, no matter what your age, no matter what your uh, health status, how to get a very healthy, peaceful body. I say this because my dentist came today to offer food to the monks. And I had gone to see him one week earlier. So <laughs> my first time going to the dentist in three years. You know, it's supposed to go to the dentist more often than that. But I went to go and see him because you know, of we can do over here. The COVID is, uh, means we can't travel. I've got a bit more time, but we can still go and see dentists. And after my appointment, uh, he told another monk that oh, Ajahn Brahm was amazing. He said he's got the teeth, the skin, and the blood of a 23-year-old. I'm 69. But he noticed that my teeth my skin and my blood are very, very healthy. And it's not because of exercise. <laughs> I don't play tennis or sport or go for runs. Yeah, I think it's mostly just because I know how to relax my body and do it often. So my body is, gets pretty much stress-free, even if I have to work a lot. So this is learning just how to be aware and be kind to your body and get this beautiful feeling of delight. The delight is a stage of almost like bliss. The body is feeling so relaxed, so at peace, you can just enjoy it for such a long time. And often I ask people to practice like this when they go to bed at night. So often people find it difficult to go to sleep. And because they find it difficult to go to sleep, they try even harder to go to sleep. And they have like insomnia and they had to take drugs to go to sleep. It's such a shame. But there's an easy way to defeat that problem with meditation. Just, just that part. You feel your body, you really feel the body. Relax all parts of it. You find a, a part which is not relaxed yet. Whenever I find it difficult to go to sleep, it's usually my legs. I just feel those legs with my mind. Feel all over them and just relax them little by little, part by part, until those legs are just so at ease as if they've been soaking in a hot bath for a long time. And there's no tightness or tension in them at all. And that's usually the next thing I know is the following morning when I woke up. It's a way to relax the body so wonderfully well and deeply using this power of meditation. So it's when the bliss comes up. Where does that bliss come from? The bliss of a relaxed body is coming from the fact that you practiced appropriately and you've just done this mindfulness and kindness together with the body. And that mindfulness and kindness has produced this state of body which is far more 
at ease than your usual experience in your daily life. The mind is automatically comparing this to how your body ordinarily feels, ordinarily feels when you're working, when you're walking, when you're doing stuff. Now you're at ease with it. And that time off when your body is at ease and relaxed is beautiful. And of course, that's just an introduction because afterwards you will find that the body is relaxed and it disappears. And then you start to relax your mind. It's exactly the same way. But that's a subject of uh, another talk on another day. Keep it just in the, in the beginning, an overview of what this meditation is. So simple. Just wanting, disappearing, so the leaf becomes still. Making peace, being kind, being gentle. This is another way of saying not doing anything. And learning just how to trust that process, not interfere with it. Just find how your body and then your mind gets so still and peaceful. So we've been going about an hour now. So what we're going to do now, according to the schedule, is to do a guided meditation for half an hour and uh, finish off at uh, 10 o'clock your time, 6 p.m. in Ajahn Brahm time in Perth. So hopefully that's okay so far. A nice introduction. There'll be some Q&A, I think, later on in your evening. But when you're doing the q and I'll be fast asleep because <laughs> it'll be in the middle of the night here in Australia. So sorry I can't join in that. But any really interesting questions, Fennel Chanda, please you can share them with me and I can also give my uh, suggestions as well. So that's just the introduction. And we do much more later on. But now, if you want to get up and have a stretch or something, or you need to go to the toilet, what I call the letting go room. <laughs> you know, even going to the toilet. Once you learn how to meditate, you know, you just, you can let go so easily. So you don't get all these other problems, you know, which people get like hemorrhoids and stuff. <laughs> because you learn how to relax instead of trying to force things. So there's so many advantages. So those who want to go to the toilet, please do so. I'm just going to pour myself a glass of water in one or two minutes. We can start the guided meditation. Okay? Very good. <laughs> okay, so is that um, okay to start now? Or should I wait for a few more moments? One minute. One minute. Okay. Wait. Let's wait for one minute. And uh, just to say that there will be a chance to ask you questions, Ajahn, after the yeah. afternoon session. So um, it will be a shorter period, but there okay, will yeah. be a chance for people to ask a few questions oh, at the end see. of yeah, your teaching right. on the Anapanasati Sutta. Excellent, marvelous. Or oh, anything else, I don't mind. Very good. Right. Okay, so this is a good time for, for a joke while people are waiting. This is the a good joke, joke I told you. Not the one I told you this afternoon. Oh, yeah. Okay, please, um, uh, I apologize if this is political, but <laughs> there was, <laughs> I think I'm in safe territory here, but there was uh, Snow White, uh, Superman and Pinocchio were walking down the street and they passed a big sign saying beauty contest. So Snow White went in and five minutes later, she came out with the first prize. She was very happy. And then they passed a sign which said, uh, strongman contest. So Superman went in, 
and five minutes later he came out with the first prize and he was also very happy. And they passed another sign saying biggest liar contest. So Pinocchio went in and when he came out he was crying disappointment saying who's Donald Trump? <laughs> Please excuse me for that political joke but I thought it was very funny. <laughs> Okie dokie, enough. <laughs> Sometimes people make jokes about me. I don't mind. That's one of the nice things which I learned you know, in just like Thai culture, Asian culture. You can make jokes, you know, even personal jokes about a person and you don't mind. It makes people happy. The, the idea of like a sense of self, where you have to protect yourself at all costs, just was not there. Anyway, so it's so one minute up. Shall we start the guided meditation? Excellent. <clears throat> so the meditation will last about 25 minutes. So just uh, towards the end of the uh, session this morning. So wherever you are sitting or lying down, just close your eyes. And the reason we close our eyes when we meditate in the Theravada tradition, that's you know, the original uh, tradition of Buddhism, is because that we can close off one of our senses and be more aware of another sense, in particular the sense of physical touch. <clears throat> So, ask yourself, how are you sitting right now? How does it feel? Can you make your posture a little bit more comfortable? I am sitting on a chair now. I don't usually meditate on a chair, I prefer the floor. So I'm going to just adjust my position on the chair to make it a little bit more comfortable for me. I didn't realize that when I was talking, but now I'm focusing on it. It's very easy to see. And once you've got into a, a general good meditation posture, now be more refined. Have a look at your feet. And just not with your eyes, but with your mind. Feel the sensations in your feet. How do they feel? And can you make your feet more comfortable? If you wish, you can ask your feet, feet, how are you? Do you need to be moved, adjusted? If you treat your feet, not as your slave, but as a friend, as part of your body, which you care for, rather than exploit, you will feel just how the feet are or whether they need a little bit of adjustment. I've adjusted my feet to be flat on the floor and they feel really good now. And only when you feel your feet are comfortable, do you move your attention up to your ankles and calves. How do they feel now? When you focus your attention there, you can actually feel sensations in your ankles and calves. And my ankles and calves feel 
pretty good right now. So I can just pretty much leave them alone and move over, move up to my knees. All these years I've been meditating cross-legged. You'd think that my knees would get a bit worn out and be sore, but because I care for them, I look at them, ask if they're okay, and they respond. That bit of care and a tiny adjustment here or there keeps my knees really healthy. So I can sit for hours and there's nothing wrong with my knees. So it gives some mindfulness and kindness, what we call kindfulness to your knees. How do they feel? And I'm really relaxing my knees now and I start to get the delightful feeling, like a tingling feeling in my knees. It's like they're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for caring about us. Are there individual beings which come together to form my body? And I care for them. If they hurt, I hurt. I care for you, knees. I move my attention up to my thighs. Huge muscles. Because I don't play sport, but the monastery where I live is on a hill, so there's lots of going up hills and down hills. So they, they need a bit of support as well. I feel them. It's hard to describe the feeling in my thighs. I'm aware of the sensation of those muscles. Now I'm a bit tired, but they're pretty okay. And I give them lots of kindness. And I feel that they relax. And I go up from my thighs to my butt. Sitting on a chair, I can feel the part of my bottom, which is squashed against the, the chair. You can't really adjust that posture. What I can do though is care for my butt muscles. Just doing that much, I do actually feel some relaxation happening. At ease. Caring for this body, which is supporting my weight. And I go further up from my butt to my waist. And I can feel that, the, the waist feeling, I don't know what else to call it. And I just give a stretch to my back. I love doing this, stretching my back. I see animals in the forest, even like kangaroos do this. Good stretch. Oh, that feels good. And then let go. And the waist feels, it's like it's saying thank you. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for caring for me. If there's anything else it needs, like move my body to the left or the right, I'll do that too. To find the optimum position for my waist. If there's any, anything inside your body, you now maybe in your, your colon, which is irritating you, just focus in on that feeling. And don't try to get rid of the pain. Don't try and heal it. That's actually a negativity there. Care for that feeling. It is wonderful loving kindness. And you find that relaxes everything and allows the body to do the healing. You just do the caring. My body is very good at healing itself. As long as I let it and don't get in its way. I move my awareness up from my waist. After halfway up to my chest, but not up to my chest yet. 
feel some of those intestines. I don't know what those, some of those um, organs are, but I can have a quick check and just feel if there's any tightness or any imbalance there. If I can notice anything, I just pause there. And just like on, say, Google Maps, you zoom in. You zoom in and feel that sensation as deeply as you can. It may be unpleasant, it may be painful, but feel it. And give this beautiful kindness. Like you're picking up an injured bird. And you're just giving it as much loving kindness, compassion as you possibly can, can generate. You feel the bird relax. Its pain start to disappear. Kindness, compassion is very powerful, very therapeutic, and it, tains, it takes away a lot of the physical pain allows healing to occur. You move your awareness up, up past the central part of your body to your chest area. And I say this especially for females, because one of the worst conditions, not just COVID, but there's far too many people have cancers in the breast. And even before, I teach this at cancer clinics in Australia. Even before it occurs, if you're aware to the sweeping of your body, you can actually feel there's something not quite right there. You feel there's an imbalance, there's a tightness, a tension, or whatever you wish to call it. Just focus on it. Don't be scared, but give it kindness. Give it care. Give it love. And you may experience, feel, whatever was the irritation gets less of a problem. Body starts to relax. And the body begins to heal itself. Itself without having to have all these other interventions, which can be quite, quite coarse. problems or lung problems, whatever. Just feel what's there. You find something which is slightly you know, not light. And I use this language because it's so difficult to get all the right words. I feel there's a bit of tightness in my back right now. I'm going to those places. I'm just relaxing them to the max with kindness. I've been doing this for years, it's quite easy. But you can find that I bring it to a state of rest, ease. It feels good. And I go up to my top of my torso, the shoulders. And shoulders are often tight. That's why when you have a massage, that's one of the first places people massage their shoulders. How do your shoulders feel right now? One useful technique is to scrunch up your shoulders. You scrunch them up as tight as you can. And when you can't scrunch them up, anymore, then you let them go. You let go. And they become more loose than they were when you started. I feel my shoulders, they got much looser now. And I can feel the sensations are much more comfortable than they were when I began a minute or two ago. I just go down my arms. My forearms are usually not much going on there. They're comfortable. 
If you do find an ache or a pain, that's a stop, pause. Give it as much compassion and kindness and love as you possibly can. Care for it to relax it to the max. And don't go on any further until you feel you've made a difference there. And pass your elbows. If you play sports like tennis or something, then you may have sore elbows. Just feel them. What do your elbows feel like right now? Give this wonderful kindness. May you be happy and well, elbows. I care for you too. And then you go down your forearms to your wrists and hands. And now I'm just zooming in on my hands. The posture which I have in my hands is not a standard posture. There's fingers all over the place. And my hands feel comfortable. I ask them, do you want to be adjusted? They say no. Follow what your hands tell you to do, not what books and experts tell you to do. Feel them. And relax your hands. And even though I'm just focusing on my hands, it's almost like I'm getting into a nice deep state of calm, calmness already. Feels good. I go back up to my shoulders and make sure they're still comfortable and up to my neck. I make sure the head is well balanced on top of the neck. I usually do exercises left, right, forward, back. Did I find the optimum place this evening? For me anyway, this is this morning for you. The optimum position for my head on top of the neck. If you have cold or hay fever like I have. I can look at my throat and I can calm it down. It's like I create a mental hand and I just stroke the inside of my throat calmly to settle it down, to soothe it until my throat feels just so at ease. And only when it feels at ease do I move upwards, upwards and to my face. There's so many nerve endings on your face. It's easy to be aware of your face, especially muscles around my eyes and my mouth, maybe my forehead. How do they feel? And care for them. You find the muscles around your eyes, they really relax. They start to soften and loosen. Same around the mouth. There's no tight muscles there for me anymore. You know that the face, its tightness or its looseness, reflects the emotions you're experiencing inside. So if you relax the face, you're also lessening some of the emotions of fear, anxiety, ill will. And when those facial muscles are relaxed, it's like they're being replaced by kindness, peace, gentleness. And my face feels great with those type of emotions loosening all the muscles around my face. The last thing which I was introducing, sometimes it works for some people, for others it doesn't. But on the first meditation of the retreat, I think it can be useful. I imagine that my head, that I can open up the top of the skull, like a hinge on one side, I just open up the skull and take out my brain. It's only a small thing. And I put it in a little basket next to me. It's got a nice cushion in that basket, a little blanket and a pillow. And I put my brain 
in that little basket and say to my brain, have a rest. You thought so much. You made so many decisions. You worked so hard, my brain. Take a break. I'll put you back afterwards. And I imagine my brain, like in a cartoon picture of a brain, looking at me and saying, thank you. And it closes its eyes and falls asleep for a few minutes. It's just a skillful means of not having to work your brain so hard when you're meditating at least, giving it a rest so you can be at peace and your brain can take a break. And having relaxed parts of the body one by one, now I put my awareness on my whole body, whole body just sitting here. It feels so wonderful, my body anyway. I relax part by part, it's still a part which needs focus. Zoom in on it to the exclusion of all other parts of your body. And give it just a mass of kindness. However you feel that kindness is. And allow the body to be at peace. I'm sitting here, aware of the whole body, relaxed to the max. So how my body feels now. And soon, I can feel this delightful sensation. The delight of relaxation. I develop my awareness on that delightful feeling. Same which people can feel when they're on a recliner by the beach somewhere. Or they're in a hot tub. Or just lying in a soft bed early in the morning, not needing to get out. It's cozy and at ease, delightful feeling. That's what my body feels like now. Delightful relaxation. And enjoy that. There's only a few minutes left of this meditation session. So I'm going to be quiet for three or four minutes to allow you to enjoy the delight of bodily relaxation. I'm going to enjoy it too. It's getting close now to the end of this meditation period. How do you feel? What's your body like? And your mind, your inner world, how peaceful is that? 
enjoy for a few more minutes, a few more seconds, sorry. And when you're ready, just open your eyes. When this meditation at ease and peace, gives you a taste of freedom. Ooh. And don't forget to smile at the end of a meditation. <laughs> You know, sometimes as a meditation teacher, you know, I'm always sitting up front looking at other people. <laughs> when I open my eyes after a nice meditation, look at everybody else. And sometimes I had a really great meditation myself, but looking at others makes me feel depressed. <laughs> we get to smile at the end of a good meditation. So please smile. It allows the joy of the meditation to come out into the joy of what happens afterwards. Well, there we go. I hope that was of use to you. And as you all know, I just, for my whole life as a monk, I make this up as I go along. All the teachings there, you know them very well. And how you put them together in each session. I don't plan it out. I don't prepare anything. Just to give you a start. And then we see how it goes for the next session, which is coming in was a couple of hours time. I wish you all happiness and well-being. Very good. So now should I just click out or is there anything you want to say? Uh, I think that's all, Ajahn.